President Roosevelt and General Patton. Before we begin tonight's program, please join retired Army General Hank McManus as he leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. General McManus. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, General. Tonight's event is brought to us by the HIP Lecture Series on International Affairs and National Security a program made possible by Wofford alumnus Van Hip, who is the distinguished looking gentleman in the middle on stage. Hold on a second. Yeah, right. Van Hip is chairman of the American Defense, of American Defense International, a Washington DC based consulting firm specializing in government affairs, business development, and public relations. Mr. Hip, on behalf of Wofford, we thank you for your continued generous contributions to the college. We would also like to recognize Don Morenci, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of the United States Navy, who is also with us this evening. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Ben Patton, the youngest grandson of General George S. Patton, and Kevin Kukini, the great-great-grandson of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Ben Patton is founder and executive director of the Patton Veterans Project, and Kevin Kukini is co-host of the Armstrong Williams Show on Sirius XM Radio. Before turning the program over to Mr. Hip, I'd like to take just a few minutes to set the stage historically on how both Roosevelt and Patton influenced our nation and our world today. Franklin D. Roosevelt and George S. Patton, the politician and the soldier, the president and the general, the squire of Hyde Park and old blood and guts. They were, in many respects, quite different men. FDR was known for his political wiles, his uncanny politician's ability to leave everyone who spoke with him thinking he had agreed with whatever they had advocated, while Patton was famous for his soldiers' unadorned bluntness <coughs> and plain spokenness. Yet their lives also closely paralleled each other in important ways. Though they were born on opposite coasts, FDR in New York and Patton in California, they were born less than four years apart, FDR in 1882 and Patton in 1885. They died less than eight months apart in 1945. After graduating from West Point, Patton began his military career in the Army in 1909. One year later, in 1910, Franklin Roosevelt began his political career by winning a New York State Senate seat. The First World War proved pivotal in the respective careers of both men, preparing both for the central roles they would play in the Second World War. FDR became Assistant Secretary of the Navy under President Wilson, while Patton served under General Pershing in France. Both were then supporting players, unknowingly rehearsing for the leading roles they would each play over 25 years later. It was, of course, the role that each man played in the epic struggle against Nazi Germany that made each an important figure, not just in American history, but in world history. It was that common cause that led their stories to become inextricably intertwined. Once the United States became directly involved in the war against Germany, FDR was intent that American troops take the offensive against the Nazis before the end of 1942, and it was Patton who would lead the first major US offensive, Operation Torch, in North Africa. When FDR met with Churchill at Casablanca in 1943, Patton was in charge of his security, and the two met there for the first time. Patton, of course, did his job willingly and well, but he also told the president's doctor, quote, I hope you'll hurry up and get the hell out of here. The Germans occupied this place for two years, and their bombers know how to hit it. They were around 10 days ago, and it's a cinch they'll be back. Despite their different styles, they seemed to have admired each other. FDR reveled in Patton's blunt talk. After reading a report from Patton, FDR remarked to an aide, Patton is a joy. And he also said Patton was, quote, America's greatest fighting general. After meeting the president, Patton wrote in his diary that FDR, quote, really appeared as a great statesman. And a biographer writes that FDR's death in April 1945, quote, 
distressed Patton greatly. Each man excelled at his given role. FDR is generally considered a political genius and regularly is rated by historians as one of the greatest presidents behind just Washington and Lincoln. Patton had, as the title of one biography says, a genius for war, and he has been called, quote, the premier tactician of mobile warfare. Their joint cause, the defeat of Nazi Germany, made possible the post-war world in which we still live, and made possible the general European peace that has thus far lasted nearly 73 years. In many ways, the world we live in is a world that Roosevelt and Patton helped to make. Which brings us, finally, to tonight's event. One of the challenges I find in, in teaching history is convincing the young that our connections to what seems to be a distant past is not only real and relevant, but not all that distant. One of the ways we can make that connection is through the idea of family. Each of our guests tonight, even as he pursues a unique individual path in his own life, making contributions distinct from those of his forebearer, is a living connection to this epical history. In my Western Civilization class recently, I was talking about the First World War, now nearly a full century in the past. That seems like a long time ago, I admitted to my students. But it's closer than we think. I showed them this medal. It belonged to my grandfather, and it's for his participation in the Somme Offensive in France in 1918. I knew this man growing up, and he was there. When I was preparing for this evening, I discovered that I shared a kind of connection like this with one of our guests. George Patton saw his first combat in Mexico under Persia in 1916. This is my grandfather's medal for his participation in that same action. My grandfather, Tom Burns, was there with Patton. So, Mr. Patton, our grandfathers were both there. And tonight, we're both here. <laughs> cool. Tonight, we have the great opportunity to hear from these two men, to remember how closely we are connected to our common past, and to learn how they are making their own marks in our world today. So without much further ado, I will turn the evening over to them and Van Hip. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're great. Thank you. That was great, Dr. Burns, and really set the stage for tonight. And as some of y'all know here at Wofford, uh, my favorite job in the world is this is being the sideline reporter for Wofford football. And y'all got to tell Richard Johnson, I like the sound system y'all got tonight a whole lot better than the one he gives me uh, on the, for, for the Wofford football team. But it's great to be with you tonight. And one, we, have, we have so many uh, good folks here. And I want to ask all the veterans, those who have served our country, all services, to please stand and be recognized tonight. Next week is VE Day, and that's why, we, that's why we're doing this. And both Kevin and Ben uh, are, are friends of mine, and light bulbs went off a few months ago, and I said, man, if we can get you two together and tell the story and do it close to VE Day, that would be great. Because I'm one who believes that education is a national security issue. There was a recent story in USA Today signing a Holocaust study that roughly two-thirds of millennials weren't sure if they'd heard the term Auschwitz. 22% said they not, were not sure if they had heard of the Holocaust itself. Education is a national security issue. My father said, he said, you know, man, he said, if ever there was a man in the last hundred years that God sent to save the free world, it was Winston Churchill, and he's right. But you know what? We had Americans of unique and uncommon valor. We had the greatest generation. We had the greatest generation who answer their country's call. We had great leaders. We had some of the greatest military leaders of all time, MacArthur and Eisenhower and Nimitz. But we had two men who I believe really rose above the rest and were there and showed the world what American leadership was at a time when we need 
when we needed American leadership. Franklin Roosevelt and General George S. Patton. And tonight, I'd like to begin the program with Kevin Kukinney. Um, I think the world of Kevin, he's actually, as, as Dr. Burns said, is a host of XM Sirius Radio, a show every night with a good friend of mine and a fellow South Carolinian, Armstrong Williams. And I told Kevin, I said, welcome to Spartanburg, because this is the hometown of probably one of your great-great-grandfather's best advisors, the director of war Mo mobilization, who went on to be one of the best secretaries of state this country ever had, Jimmy Burns. You might want to start doing your family tree on that one. But uh, Kevin, come on up. We're glad to have you. Thank you, everyone. Well, this is my first time in South Carolina, so I'm very excited to be here. And I'm very, uh, very impressed with the campus. It's very beautiful. Um, so let me, let me talk about my family a little bit. Um, so I am the great-great-grandson of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. And I am also the grandson, a great-grandson of Jimmy Roosevelt, who is his eldest son. Um, and I'm also the grandson of Franklin Thomas and Kate Whitney. And Frank Thomas is the first African-American president of the Ford Foundation. Um, and he served that for uh, over 20 years, actually. Um, and was very involved with PBS and um, bring certain programs uh, to the public. But, uh, you know, just to go over a brief uh, history of FDR, um, he was born in Hyde Park, which I'm sure everyone knows. Um, and sort of, uh, just to give a little background, so there's, there's really two branches of the Roosevelt family. And so they originally came from, um, you know, the Netherlands, and they settled in New Amsterdam. And so there's the Oyster Bay Roosevelts, and so it, it was really based off, most of them are based out of New York, but then they had two summer homes. There was the Oyster Bay uh, summer home, and then there was the Hyde Park summer home. And so that, that was the split in the family. So Theodore Roosevelt came from the Oyster Bay side, and then um, FDR came from the Hyde Park side. And so Eleanor Roosevelt is the um, niece of Teddy Roosevelt. So when she became... Uh, a Hyde Park Roosevelt, she really had to give up a lot of that because a lot of people in her family did not approve of her uh, marrying somebody from that side of the family and they, they really didn't um, get along too well uh, for certain reasons. Um, but he, uh, he had a, a wonderful career. Um, he was elected to uh, New York State Senate um, in 1910. Um, well, he studied at Groton for, his, uh, for prep school. He went to Harvard University, and then he got a law uh, degree from Columbia. After that, he was appointed the um, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, um, and a role that he didn't necessarily want, but something that um, it seemed like it was destiny because a lot of the positions that he had were the positions that Theodore Roosevelt had. Um, so after he graduated college, he um, you know, Teddy was really busy uh, when he was in office, but he had a chance to sit down with him and, and really talk about his career. And, you know, Theodore Roosevelt told him, and he was, he was practicing law at the time, and, um, but he told him that you have, you have an obligation to civic duty, to serve the public. And I think that's, that's the main message that I want to talk about today, is, is being, being a Roosevelt, and, and what does that mean? Um, personally, for me, being a Roosevelt means meeting everybody on the level, treating people with respect and dignity, and uh, also trying to help people out that um, don't have the same opportunities as, as you have. So, let's talk about the, the family crest, because that's very important to me, and it's something that I, I try to live my life by. It's family uh, motto on the family crest. It's qui plantavit curabit. And I'm sorry for my Latin. Um, that's the best I can do. But what that means is he who plants will preserve. And to me, there's different translations, but to me that means you can look at it in two different ways. Building a foundation of this country and having something that we can grow upon. Or you can view it as his family and the family that he created. And then all of the amazing things that um, the Roosevelt's have done. And um, 
you know, my, my great grandfather, Jimmy Roosevelt, he was um, definitely a, somewhat controversial at the time because he was serving as a personal aide for FDR. Um, he had a law practice as well uh, that uh, was getting certain um, contracts that were a little controversial, but what he did do is in 1936, and this is before uh, World War II, he joined the Marine Corps. And because he was the president's son, obviously he got, um, you know, he had some favors. So he became a uh, lieutenant colonel. And after, after serving for a little bit, he really avoided any of the, uh, really the trials and tribulations that all the other Marines have to go to. And, um, somewhat babied in a way, but I, I think that he realized this, that for one, it was going to hold him back later on in life if he um, was going to use his father's name um, for his benefit in that way, by, by taking a shortcut in life. Um, so what he did was he actually um, gave up that, uh, you know, honorary title, and he um, went down to a lower rank of, uh, a lower class of captain. So I think that that just has to show you a little bit about what it means to be a Roosevelt um, as far as humility, being able to recognize your weaknesses and being able to work upon them and grow. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. My, my grandfather, um, his name is Franklin, and he was named after Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And uh, somehow he married... Uh, well, he got introduced to my grandmother, who is the, the granddaughter of FDR, Eleanor, and um, it just seemed like it was destiny for them to meet. Um, and there's, there's all these connections in our, in our lives, uh, but it, it always comes back to FDR, or Theodore, or Eleanor. It's a very interesting aspect in my life, but, you know, if I had to say, how do I, how do I really carry on his legacy? Um, I'll get into that in a minute. Let me uh, go on here. So, uh, no, well, let me talk about Patton for a second. I, something I, I thought was really interesting, I, I looked this up, which I didn't know, but we are actually, or Patton and FDR were 12th cousins, two times removed. So I'm not quite sure what that means, but I think we're family somehow. <laughs> Someone has to explain that one for me. But. <laughs> um, so let me get back to let me get back to that. So as far as uh, their relationship, um, it, it, you know, they were quite removed from each other because one is a statesman and one is a military leader. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, one was a military leader, but they really had uh, great things to say about each other. Um, you know, this is a. I have to quote this one, I can't remember this one. But this is um, a conversation uh, with the press that FDR had. Um, Mr. President, is there anything you can tell us about General Patton? And this is FDR speaking. No, I saw him in Sicily. I saw him and General Clark and General Eisenhower went over with me. I think probably that you may, if you want to write a piece, stick in there the story of a former president who had a good deal of trouble in finding a successful commander for the armies of the United States. And one of them turned up one day, and he was very successful. And some very good citizens went to the president and protested, you can't keep him, he drinks. It must be a good brand of liquor, was the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and that was actually Lincoln who said that. Um, so he was quoting Lincoln. But uh, what he said, and this was uh, after a lot of controversy with Patton. And, um, there was uh, an incident where he slapped one of his soldiers, and um, press really jumped on it. And, um, it was, it was a difficult situation for Franklin to be in because he had to pick a side. It's, am I going to go with the crowd here or am I going to go with my man, the guy that I want to be on the battlefield, that I believe in, this dashing, uh, charismatic leader. Um, and so he stuck, he stuck with his guy. And I think that's very important, just the loyalty. Um, you know, sometimes, especially in politics, sometimes you have to separate yourself from somebody. But I feel like Franklin did a very good job of trying not to do that and um, being loyal. Um, 
<laughs> you know what uh, FDR said uh, about Patton? Well, he's talking about General Montgomery, but he said, Monty never starts until he's got all the guns and all the men he needs. And Patton is just the opposite. He's reckless, quick. I think it works out well to have one cautious and one reckless fellow operating on the same objective. And it's just that balance of, that balance of power that I think, uh, I think that was, there was something to that, a little bit deeper. Let me get back to the front. So let me talk about myself a little bit, um, explain my family history. Um, so, you know, right now I, I'm on Sirius XM and, you know, people ask me, especially today, I've, I've had to do quite a few uh, interviews and I, people kept asking me, what, what does it mean to be a Roosevelt? What is it, how do you carry on the legacy? Um, it's a difficult question to ask and I don't think I can personally fill those shoes, but I think it's a standard that was set. Um, he raised the bar to a certain level and um, I think the majority of his family tried to follow in his footsteps and you can argue whether or not they were successful, but that leads me to Jimmy Roosevelt. Um, and Jimmy Roosevelt was his, you know, aide. Um, but the thing about it is that if you ever watch any of the um, speeches that he gives, it's either going to be Jimmy Roosevelt, who's assisting him because he couldn't support himself um, when he was walking, or it would be one of his other sons, either Elliot or FDR Jr. Um, but this was just sort of a symbolic um, gesture to me, having your son stand next to you supporting you, um, because to, to go back to his polio, um, he got polio when he was 39 years old, and this is already after he's had a pretty successful career. So just imagine waking up one day and everything's fine, and you're on vacation, you're swimming, and then um, you have difficult, you're feeling very sick, and you just decide to go to bed, and you wake up and you can't feel your legs. Um, it's, it's difficult to put yourself in that position if, if you've never experienced um, disease or disability. Um, but it takes a lot out of you. Uh, it really does. And it can really destroy a person if they're not able to handle it. But there's something about Franklin that uh, it drove him. And, and just think about the fact that he would spend hours and hours every day exercising just to build the strength and the legs, uh, the muscles in his legs. And even after all of this work and, um, you know, he was staying in Hyde Park uh, for a little bit and he was practicing trying to appear to walk because he had to wear these uh, seven pound um, leg braces, seven pounds on each side. And then he had to wear crutches as well. And so he would have to somehow make his way a quarter of a mile um, down the road and, um, you know, he was able to do it, but when he went back to the doctor, it turns out that his muscles were actually deteriorating further. Um, so all this hard work, you know, you work so hard, you think you're going to get better, and um, you don't. And it's not his career necessarily, but it's his, it's his health, which um, relates directly to his career. But he stuck it out. He didn't let it hold him back in life. And, um, you know, I, I do have to dispel the myth that the public didn't know that he was um, handicapped, because they did know. And it was, there was a very, uh, well, infamous, but he, uh, Al Smith was running for the Democratic ticket. And he was the New York governor at the time. And so he had asked Franklin to come and speak for him. And, uh, when he was going towards uh, the stairs, all the press were around him, and this was his first time in public after <coughs> years of really trying to, to stay away. Um, he fell. He fell pretty hard and very loud and probably very embarrassing, but um, he got up and he laughed. He just laughed it off and um, made, made the speech um, eventually. and. Uh, Al Smith encouraged him to run for New York governor, which he did, uh, following in his, uh, well, Teddy's footsteps, his fifth cousin. <clears throat> um, 
excuse me. So I think that's probably one of the biggest things that um, the Roosevelt's have faced is, is these health issues. And for Teddy, it was uh, debilitating asthma. For FDR, it was polio. But they have these, uh, it almost seems like there's an equilibrium. There's a balance to the universe. The people that are blessed with all these great privileges in life, uh, money, connections, it seems like they have to have something taken away from them if, if they want to be successful. And it seems like that's what happened for whatever reason. But we're here talking about him now, so he was able to overcome that in his own way. Um, you know, I, it's hard for me to, you know, I, I feel like some of you probably can connect more to FDR than I can, just because I'm so far removed from that time period. But at the same time, I, um, you know, influenced by my own family members that were influenced by family members that were around him. But my grandmother had um, spent time with him, um, you know, as a child growing up in the, in the White House as their grandkids, because they had quite a bit of, quite a few grandkids. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, stuck out the most to me during this whole thing was um, looking through old footage um, and speaking to my gra grandmother and trying to get some more information, some more stories, just things that I could tell here. Um, but I, I showed her a video of uh, Franklin. Um, he's speaking in North Dakota, um, and he's speaking to farmers. And this is during a time during the Great Depression. And he's trying to lift people's spirits when they know that they're down. But uh, my, my great-grandmother is in the background of it. And um, uh, Betsy Cushing Whitney is her name. Um, but she was originally married to Jimmy Roosevelt before um, getting divorced and marrying uh, John Hay Whitney, who's a, a legend in his own right. <clears throat> um, but I would have to say that, you know, I, I get to avoid all of the, um, all the attention of being a Roosevelt because I have a different last name. Um, I, you know, I don't have the same situation as, as Mr. Patton over here because I, I think that makes life a little more challenging when you have a famous last name because you have big shoes to fill and you're <coughs> somewhat expected to fill them. And if you don't, it, uh, it feels like people look down upon you at, at times. Um, so how am, I making, how am I making my mark in the world? Um, for one, I do this Sirius XM show. And what we do is it's an open platform, so anybody can call in, ask questions. There's, it's always open topics, uh, especially on Fridays. Um, so that's one way that I, I, I like to think of that as, as freedom. And you know, someone asked me that on the radio, what do you, how would you define freedom? And I said being on this radio station is freedom to me, the fact that I can say what I want and there's no repercussions. I'm not going to get thrown in jail. Um, no, the military is not going to come looking for me. I'm not going to get executed when I exit my apartment later that night. Um, and th this is democracy. This is freedom. And this is the um, being able to say what you want. Free speech. <coughs> I don't know how long I've been going on here, but I can cover FDR's career, but I, I feel like most of you um, know quite a bit about him. So. Um, you know, just to, to wrap it up a little bit, I think that if FDR were alive today, which I think probably people will ask me, or they already have asked me that, is he would view, uh, how, how he would view the world. Um, personally, I think that he would try and get more involved in the United Nations and um, restore the respect that I think that they deserve. Um, but that was really his baby and um, unfortunately didn't get to see it um, carried through. But um, I think that right now it's, it's a very sensitive time 
in history. Or it's a very sensitive time, and so we have to go back in history. We have to look um, at the stories. Uh, we have to listen to the speeches. We have to look at the, the press reports. Um, and from that, you'll, you'll see a lot of similarities to the political climate today. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, I think that if he were alive, he would be working on trying to bring people together um, and, and really focus on his dream of globalization, open borders, people being able to move in and out of their countries freely, freedom of press. Um, and there, there's other things as well, but the right to not be hungry, um, to, to have clothes, to have shelter, things that most people need to survive. Um, yeah. I think in the future, what I personally can do is, f you know, I can't follow in his footsteps exactly, but what I can do is follow his example. And I think that's what everybody can do here. They can follow the examples that he set um, the relationships that he had with people, the way he spoke to people. Um, and it was never in a demeaning manner. It was always very direct. Um, he liked to compliment people, but he also would call people out. Um, you know, he had a very close relationship with Stalin, Churchill, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, China. Um, and so, you know, you have to think about what was going on at the time. and. Uh, people were being killed. And it wasn't just the Holocaust. It wasn't just uh, in Germany. There were people in the Philippines, the Bataan Death March. There was uh, Nanking. There was Manchuria. All these different places where um, really millions of people died. So I think FDR had a responsibility to act and to use his powers. And, um, and at times, he may have overstepped them. And he, he, um, really pushed a lot of buttons, but I think it was necessary for him to do what he needed to do. And I think that's why we still talk about him today, and that's why his legacy lasts, is that he, he pushed the buttons. He uh, really tried to push the limit and see what he could get away with uh, within, within the court system. Um, and, you know, that's, that's very, uh, it sounds somewhat hypocritical, but at the same time, it's, it's trying to get things done. And even if, um, it doesn't seem like there's a, a solution. There always is. There's always a way to find a solution to make things work out. Um, and I, I think I'd like to finish there. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, one person I failed to uh, recognize, I want to thank. If you noticed out front, there should be a 1942 Willis Jeep. That flew with the 101st Airborne Division on a glider, was on the beach at Normandy. I want to thank my good friend Gay Suber and veterans group he's with down in Columbia for, for bringing that with us today. Thanks, <clears> Gay. <throat> <clears throat> and Ben Patton is somebody I've known for some time and, and have, have, have had a lot of respect for. Uh, but before I, I, I turn over to Ben, I also knew Ben's uh, late father, whose name was also General George S. Patton. Is this the story? This is the story. He, oh, I've never told this, but I'm going to tell a story about your dad tonight and me that I've never told him before. He said, all right, so here it goes. So I was, this was probably 1991. It was after Desert Storm. We were doing the, we had we'd already done the demobilization, but the military, under Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense, was beginning to, um, to cut units and cut units pretty severely with our force structure in the military. So I was at a party one night, and of course, General Patton, I guess he had been retired from active duty probably at least 10 years or so around that time. But he knew I was friends with Ben. With ben. And he knew I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army. And he came up to me, he said, Van, I'm so dead gum mad. Now, he didn't quite use that language, he was on something else. He said, he said the Army, he says, y'all are cutting too much, you're deactivating stuff. He says, Second Armored Division. You have deactivated the Second Armored Division. My dad commanded that unit, and I did too. And then I said, I'm sorry, General. He says, the 11th Cavalry Regiment. My dad commanded that uh, regiment, and I did too. So finally I got out of there. So next morning, I said, uh, 
Should I or shouldn't I? I took out my little stationery, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army, and wrote a little note to General Patton. General Patton, it sure was good to see you last night. Are there any other units that both you and your dad commanded so we can be sure and deactivate those two? <laughs> about a month or two later, I saw him. I'm not going to tell you what he, what he said to me, but it was, but it was colorful. But I want to introduce Ben. And uh, one thing about the Patton family, they, they, they love the military, <coughs> they love the veterans, but they understand it goes beyond that and to take care of our veterans. And Ben will tell you a little bit tonight about the Patton Veterans Project. I've been so impressed with and, and admire his work with what he's done and is continuing to do to help take care of our veterans when they return home on the home front. Ben Patton. I had not heard that story. Huh? I had not heard that story. Okay, so give me, we'll just be a minute and we'll, we'll put that thing. I mean, no, I mean, I can, I'll light it up right now, but I'm not quite ready to, to show it yet. So hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties if we do. It's, it's my fault, and if any of you all get finished with my remarks before I do, you're free to leave. But I hope you stay, because it's going to be really interesting. First of all, thank you, Dr. Burns, and thank you, everybody, Debbie Thompson, for just getting me here. In fact, from just around the corner, if Van hadn't had me to a beer right before, I would have found this building that I've already been in this afternoon much quicker. But anyway, so, uh, and thank you to everybody for putting this together, and for Kevin for being here as well. And um, so... The patents pushed the envelope a little too, my grandfather did, but unfortunately he wasn't president, so he got fired two or three times as a result of pushing the envelope. So, but what I, what I want to try to do today is, and I have the same challenge that Kevin does, is that we didn't know our famous forebears. I mean, I didn't know my grandfather. But I have one thing that I can say is that I knew another general patent, who's the one that Van was referring to, and he had two stars on his shoulders, and he was kind of a tough character, and, and people don't realize because he didn't fight in wars that we remember uh, individuals from so much, except in negative contexts often, but um, he uh, had one tour in, in Korea and one tour in, in Vietnam, uh, three tours in Vietnam, um, commanding the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment was one of them, and, and I'll just say I was really impressed with my own father when I looked up at his commendations and saw that over one six-week period he earned two distinguished service crosses, a silver star and a purple heart, which are two and three uh, on the... Uh, the list of medals for valor and the Purple Heart, and uh, actually was, believe it or not, more decorated than his father and saw more frontline combat. So he was kind of my hero, and I, I, my, father, my grandfather's up there, and my father both are pleased that we're talking about them. Um, but, uh, but I will say that my dad had a lot of qualities of his father, and I wanted to talk a little about both of them to give you a sense, I guess, sort of by, I don't know, I I'm, I'm, I'm want to sort of help you understand a little bit about my grandfather through my understanding of my father. So we'll try that, see if it works. And like I said, you can, you can take off if you don't find it very interesting. But um, and some, at some point, I'm going to find a way to work in intimat, intimani, intimanatus fulget. I'm going to work that into my talk at some point. But I haven't figured it out yet. So, so I want to give you a little bit of a comparison between these two guys. And I'm going to use the movie to help me do it. Has anyone seen the movie Patton here? <clears throat> so, well, <clears throat> so I'm going to try and use Hollywood to help me compare them a little bit. So in the motion picture Patton, which of course I commend to you, probably the first movie I ever saw. I don't think, the, I, don't think I was 13 when I saw I think I was five actually. Um, but um, so in the, in the, in there's, a, there's a wonderful scene in the movie Patton. It's kind of a perhaps somewhat fictionalized scene, but I think it rings true, where the middle of the Battle of the Bulge, uh, Patton, George C. Scott's Patton is in his, uh, in his uh, headquarters in the Ardennes, and, um, and he gets bad news about weather, hated bad weather, had a lot of it, and, he, and this consequent poor air cover, and that they would have to delay an attack. And so he looked around, looks around at the, at the room with a, you know, 100 people in it, his whole staff, and he says, we're going to attack all night, we're going to attack in the morning, we're, and if we're not victorious, let no man come back alive. And his aide, Lieutenant Charles Codman at the time, leans over to him in the movie and says, you know something, General? He says, sometimes the men can't tell when you're acting and when you're not. And then Patton turns back to him in his classic response and says, Codman, it's not important for them to know. It's only important for me to know. So now we go from Hollywood, and I would say that's many versions of that exchange, I'm sure, happen. So now we go to a, a book, actually. I wrote a book about my father because, again, he's, my, one, of my, he's one of my great heroes. He's certainly in my small, small pantheon of heroes. And he commanded the armor school 
in uh, the early 1970s in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And I wrote a chapter in my book called Growing Up Pat, and came out about five years ago. Um, and one section was on his spiritual influences. So I, had, uh, I did a section on each of his favorite chaplains. I, basically the book, my father died in 2004 as a result of Parkinson's and just, just having lived, you know, life at full speed for 80 years and being a little bit accident prone and uh, not knowing much about slowing down. So I wrote a book about him which, where I tried to go back, although I was with him into my 30s, I went back and I wanted to meet people that I knew that thought could put together a picture of my father that I never perhaps took the time to understand. I mean, I spent a lot of time hunting and fishing with him and we got pulled out of school a bunch of times to go to battlefields or to hear important people speak on military history. But, um, but uh, I wanted to go back and put together a picture of him and ask questions of these individuals, some of whom were relatives, some of whom were people that served with him, to better understand him. And in, and in, in so doing, better understand my grandfather. So here is the chapter, beginning of a chapter on Glenn Myers, who was the chaplain at the armor school. So basically, they were coming back on a mid-November day, and it was snowing in Kentucky, which doesn't happen that often anymore. And uh, they had just, I think, laid a wreath at the, at the, um, at the, um, at the grave of uh, Zachary Taylor, former president and military leader. And uh, <laughs> so when they're coming back, they're on their way back in the snow, and they, and they, and I'll quote from here, they spotted a soldier hitchhiking in his summer uniform in the snow. And here's how, here's how Chaplain or Myers remembers what happened next. And forgive the salty language, but I think, you know, we can handle it. Um, Stop the goddamn car, said General Patton. My dad was a one-star at the time. He beckoned the young soldier inside and said, do you know how cold it is outside there? What are you doing? Chaplain Myers, no, sorry, um, he said, well, I'm on my way to hawk my wedding ring so I can buy Thanksgiving dinner for my family, the soldier said. Let me see that damn ring, said the general. It's just a cheap-looking thing. He turned to Myers. What do you think, Myers? What's this worth? I don't know, sir. I'm not a pawnbroker. Patton turns back to the soldier. Why aren't you wearing your winter uniform, young man? He asked. The soldier replied that every time he visited the supply room, it was closed. So Patton gazed at him for a minute. He says, son, do you know who I am? He asked, no, sir, but... I think you're some kind of general. <laughs> so so uh, he said, well, you're about to find out what kind of general I am. Take me to your headquarters. I want to talk to your commander right now. When they arrived, the soldiers spotted Patton's uniform and shouted attention as he and the rest of the group walked up the stairs. The commander was a lieutenant colonel, and he looked terrified. At ease, Patton said. He pointed to, this, pointed to the soldier. Do you see this poor, shivering SOB or something like that? Uh, yes, I see him, said the commander. Well, he's never been issued winter clothing. By 1,600 hours, I wanted to have a complete winter issue. You understand me, Colonel? And he better get it. And if he doesn't, I'm after you. Yes, sir, he said to the commander. I'll take care of myself. You better. Or you'll be doing something else tonight, Patton said. Then as he was leaving the office, this is my old man, he wheeled around dramatically. You, he said, addressing the young soldier. Son, if you try to hack that ring, I'll have you court-martialed. That's a direct order. <laughs> so, yes, sir, said the soldier. Back down. Back downstairs, Myers asked, Chaplain Myers asked my dad, can you really do that, General Patton? <laughs> Patton shook his head, Myers, Myers, that's theater. So, you know, this is, this is the persona that he picked up from his father, you know? I don't think my, my grandfather wanted every person to die on the battlefield, and my dad wasn't going to port-martial a young soldier, but he knew how to use his personality in a powerful way. So I always like that example because it sort of shows the, the two of them side by side. And... Um, and, you know, a lot of people do ask me, you know, were they a lot alike? And I say, well, of course they were, because they kind of grew up in the same environment. I mean, my, you know, and, and, I, and I grew up in that environment. So I was going to start by just showing you a little clip of the, of the world we lived in growing up. And what's interesting is that my family, I don't know whether they thought they were going to be significant in history, or they just were impressed with themselves, or they just were hoarders, but we didn't throw anything out. We still have the the piece of shrapnel that went into my great-great-grandfather's gut in the third battle of Winchester in Virginia, and, and the shirt tail that, went, that it went through. So, so, I mean, we really don't throw anything out. So both of them were avid filmmakers, and I have a filmmaking background, and my grandfather took a camera everywhere, and some of the pictures you saw right there, you saw him holding a camera, took movies, my dad did the same thing. We have every single birthday and every single Christmas coming down the stairs to open the presents. So anyway, so I thought, um, I would show you just a little bit of a, uh, a clip from some of the home movies that they collected, 
and I'll annotate them a little bit. And let's see if we can get this working here. Okay, so let's see, we kind of get the crest, Kristen, Kristen thing here. And, um, and let's see, get this to work. So here's just a little bit. These are, you'll hear my dad's voice throughout this. And by the way, if anyone's seen the movie Patton, that is not my grandfather's voice. He was a tough guy, no doubt about it. And I wouldn't mess with him. But my, grand, my dad had the voice that, that my grandfather would have loved to have had. He had the George C. Scott voice, and you'll hear some of it here. So here we go. Let's see. Can we make this work? I'm sure we can. I might do the headphone jack. My name is Wicked Willie. I'm a terror understand. I'm a pirate on the ocean and a robber on the land. That was a damn poem I had to memorize. Sorry. This is Aberdeen. And they're looking at these tanks. And this is what used in World War I. They still have one working at Fort Knox. And I'm getting out of the tank. That's quite a picture. We're good. A little rough, the footage, but this is, uh, these are French Renault tanks. I had to do the same thing. Okay, let's be let's be fair. Yeah, I always find this very interesting because we can get into another not another day we can talk about about the Normandy landings. But my grandfather sailed across the Pacific in the 1930s and back, and he must have been and he done, you know, amphibious landings in North Africa and multiple amphibious landings in Sicily. And he must have been very upset at himself for slapping a soldier that led him to lose command of the invasion of Normandy because he knew more about the ocean than almost everyone in the Navy. That's him at 50. Now here, it's important here, we, the, the, just keep in mind, the Patton family, the building of the model boats really isn't the point, as you were about to see. We did that too. Now this is interesting. Uh, and I look at the, you see the old post office and the Washington Monument in the background, 1938-39, you know, when the, when the Germans are thinking about annexing Austria and invading Poland, we're, the Americans didn't even have a tank unit. My grandfather was commanding in the old, in the, uh, in the uh, third infantry, you know, regiment there in, in, um, in, you know, the old guard, I guess it was in Washington, in horse cavalry. And a year, you know, I mean, this is just crazy. And a year before that, he's in Fort Riley, Kansas, looking like George Custer. So, but here he made chain mail and uh, for a Halloween party, and she came as Guinevere, and he came as King Arthur. So, just shows you what they were up to. But anyway, it gives you a little taste of what I dealt with as a kid. And uh, we had a lot of fun, no doubt about it. But um, anyway, but I, but I, I love to sort of root for my father because you have to consider some of the facts here. I, I put, I put the, his, the, the history students to the test today. I wouldn't say they passed with flying colors, but I'm, I'm going to happily come back. You know, they're not done with their year yet, so you know, you've got to test them hard, Dr. Burns, right? But, uh, but anyway, so you think about the timeline. 19, my dad was fortunate enough to be able to go away to boarding school, and, and it was a wonderful thing for all of us in my family because it helped with getting a more consistent education. If you could afford it, you know, you didn't have to, because we moved in multiple times in the middle of the year. And when I got to about ninth or 10th grade, it was a little messed up, as good of a time as I was having, because uh, we were moving off times in, in October or February from Germany to Texas and all that kind of stuff. So, but my father went away to boarding school. Then my grandfather got wrapped up in the beginnings of the war. Then my dad got into West Point. So the fall of 1942, my grandfather visited my, my dad in, at West Point for maybe a couple hours and said, I'm going on the secret mission, I can't talk about it. Then uh, he saw them, the next, only other time he saw them was in the summer of 1945 and he came back for a brief, sort of a, bail bo a brief bond tour, war bond tour with Jimmy Doolittle and he saw him maybe for a week or so in Massachusetts. And then he went back and, uh, and then was in a free car accident six months later. And um, so they really didn't, they didn't see much of each other and then, um, he, uh, he lived 12 more days, so December 9th, he was in this car accident. December 21st, he died. My grandmother didn't allow him, 
my dad my dad to come over to to uh, uh, to Heidelberg, Germany, where he was in the hospital to see him because he was in exams and she wanted him to stay in exams. And then and when he died, for some reason, she didn't let him come to the funeral. I think maybe she wanted that time to herself. Then six months later, my father graduated from West Point and a veteran came up to my dad, you know, George S. Patton IV, he was actually the fourth, and said, uh, I think he was a third army veteran and said, you know, you'll never be the man your father was, but congratulations anyway. So I'm always struck by whenever somebody says, well, what's it like to grow up in the shadow? I'm like, no big deal compared to that. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're the son of this incredibly famous and then suddenly dead hero, and then that's the, first, that's the thing you hear on the very first day of your professional career. So, and a lot of people say that, that my grandfather wasn't an involved father, that he was very self-involved and something of a prima donna. Those are true as well. But they corresponded regularly, almost every week, um, from the battlefront, and, and uh, in fact, people would gather around my dad to read the letters that were coming from the front from my grandfather that are blacked out lines by the, by the censors and all that sort of stuff, but they had a, quite a robust relationship, and I think my father, in his career, he also spent you know, a lot more time away from home than my grandfather, but he and my mother corresponded by, first by, by letter, and then by reel-to-reel, -reel, and then by audio tape throughout Vietnam, and actually I'm uh, in my book, actually, a lot of that correspondence is transcribed, but it's just an incredibly robust collection of, of these wonderful um, uh, musings back and forth. And, you know, you can hear the Hueys in the background, my dad's sitting in his tent in the middle of the night, and my mom has us talking on the microphone. It was quite something. But they were a lot, and they were similar in a lot of ways. I mean, they, they were, my father always used to tell me, and again, this is me trying to talk about my grandfather, who I know is the subject, one of the subjects tonight, but I can't really do that in an authentic way without talking about my father, so that's why I talk about my father. But they, my father used to tell me that there were two kinds of leaders, persuasive leaders and obtrusive leaders. And um, I know persuasive leaders may have been like Lee or perhaps Bradley. Um, I don't know about FDR, I'd say he's somewhere in between. Churchill was more of an obtrusive leader, MacArthur, Halsey, Napoleon. Uh, and I think we know which one my grandfather was, and you can guess which one my father was, too. Um, they were both led from the front. They, they used persona in a very strong way. Um, they both got in harm's way quite a bit, uh, but, not, but not by accident. Yes, my father was, was widely decorated, you know, multiple uh, medals for valor, but, but it's because he put himself... He learned from his father to put himself at the critical point in a battle to move the ball forward. If you, even if you look in the movie Patton or any photographs of my grandfather or video of him, you never see him going backwards. And whether he was afraid or not, and of course he had to go back at night to get back to eat his dinner, but, but he would go back by plane or something like that, but he was never seen on the ground going backwards. He was always moving forward in his command car because he wanted them to see him with his stars on and in full regalia. And my father was the same way. He called it visible personality, inserting yourself in a critical point in a battle when you can move the ball forward. And I got to experience that as a little kid in a peacetime situation when he was commander of the 2nd Armor Division. By going, I remember we used to get up and we'd go to these mess halls. They were like, now they're called defects, but uh, dining facilities, but they were mess halls back then. And there were maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 of them at Fort Hood, Texas. And he'd wake me up in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, which is just absurd. And, and we would go and we'd hit a different mess hall, whatever time they opened, 6 a.m. or something, and we go to a different one every, every week. And I'll tell you, the first time we walked in there, I'll never, I mean, they looked scared to death. They saw my dad, and he wears white stars, and in a few minutes, I'm going to play a little clip of him talking about why he wears white stars. But um, we would go in there, and, the, and at first, they would be scared to death. They'd be like, oh, my God, he's a general. Oh, my God, he's, I hope the grits are good. But then after a few weeks, it became, it became this thing of, like, my dad and this is maybe a point of distinction from, from his father, but he was very much like in there with them. And my grandfather was the same way, but I think he, just from my perspective, he was a little more revered, like some sort of a painful god, you know, that they admired, but was really difficult to be around, and, and you never knew what was going to happen. My dad was more like, my brother always said, who's a historian, wonderful historian, who wrote a wonderful book about our family called The Pattons. Um, but he used to say that my father would have been just as happy being a truck driver, being a sergeant. We used to go hunting and fishing with these guys on the weekends, many of whom I interviewed, and they could be generals or they could be privates. All, if they could shoot, they were going with us. If they could fish, they're going fishing with us. Didn't really matter what rank they were, what color they were, anything else. And it was just great about my dad. And um, so I, the, the thing I want to show you, and again, I try to do this in the context of, um, of trying to explain to you my understanding of the great General Patton, 
through my father, is I want to show you a clip about this guy who wakes up to his, you know, his father's gone and it, when he's just turned, uh, let's see, 22, you know, three days out. His birthday was on December 24th and his dad died on the 21st. So three days before his 22nd birthday, loses his father, doesn't get to be with him at graduation, doesn't get to share any successes in his career with him. And he also constantly has to be introduced as General Patton's son, which my father patently refused to do. He always said, don't introduce me as Patton's son. Of course, it's difficult when your name is General George S. Patton. But, you know, but anyway, I want to share with you a little clip, which I'll cue up here. So I just think this is great. My mother said it's her favorite interview with my father. Um, and I've showed it to a couple people today. But it just, I think you'll appreciate it. It just shows you, let's see, forgive the technical issues at my end, but hey. It just shows you, or what I think it shows is how this is a guy 30, let's say 30 years into his career, let's say 31 years into his career. He's commander of the 2nd Armored Division, he, um, which is the same division his father had commanded just before World War II. And he's a guy that's, like, confident. I don't think this is a guy who's saying, I'm this famous guy's son. This is a guy who is, who is who's saying, I'm George Patton, goddammit. Pay attention. So take a look at this. And this sort of unsuspecting female reporter asks him a particular question, and I think you'll like how my father answers it. You wear Oops, sorry. white stars instead of camouflage stars. Two reasons. I'm glad you asked. Why do you wear white stars instead of camouflage stars? Two reasons. I'm glad you asked that. First, so that there's no problem with anyone recognizing who I am, and that if I don't get the proper salute after I give the proper salute, I've got a case where I can stop the Jeep and take corrective action. Second, to give the enemy a target to shoot at. In other words, to, uh, if it goes, you know, if we have a war, to flaunt myself in front of them and give them a target. Now that shocks me. I, I'm sure it would. Did you intend it to? No. Well, I just I believe uh, generals yeah. should be seen. But, but you're serious about giving the enemy a target? Yes, that's right. I don't believe that we have certain people around here that, that won't wear their insignia in the field. And uh, not in this division. Although I did run into one the other day who now wears his insignia. But uh, I believe in uh, letting them know I'm around. Is your life not more valuable than all of that? I suppose it's valuable. I rather like I'm enjoying it, and we're a long time dead. But I happen to believe that I should set the example and be seen. I should not only be seen by the frontline soldier, but I, if I show the enemy these stars, that means that shows them that I have a certain disdain for their accuracy of fire, whoever they are, and I, in fact, do retain that disdain. You're not... I don't think regulation. they're nine feet tall. You're not um, going against Army regulation in wearing the white stripes. I'm sure I am. We well, you know who that is. But there are other people who wear funny things in their uniforms, too, that also go against regulation. Suffice it to say, no one has ever spoken to me about this. Suffice it to say. And I'll continue to wear them until I'm ordered to take them off. Right. Does, that, does that look like a guy who thinks he's anybody's son? He, that, my dad was just, you know? So anyway, so I, I don't want to take, I know we're sort of over time here, but I just want to close with a few thoughts. <coughs> um, I mean, these two guys are very similar. They both cared deeply about their soldiers. They both visited military hospitals a lot. Neither one of them particularly liked to do it because it, kind of dented that persona. You know, you want to get that idea of moving forward. And when you see, you know, it's tough to see the soldiers, I think, for them. But they knew it was important, and they did it. Obviously, my grandfather lashed out not once but twice. 
And amazingly, and nobody knows this, but my dad and me and who are, you know, I mean, he was the only one that was there, was he had a similar institute in, in Korea where somebody left their post at a foxhole in the middle of a firefight. And he went back and pulled a pistol on the guy, you know, and said, I'm going to have you tried for misbehavior before the enemy. And, you know, privately. And then, and then that guy, you know, I think he shipped him out the next day. Maybe not the right thing to do, but you can sort of understand their mentality. Both of them, uh, you know, really, really deeply mourn the loss of their soldiers. My dad spent, you know, half an hour in his helicopter the day he left the Black Horse unit, rereading the names of those soldiers that he lost. Like, I think there were like 60 or 70 of them. And, um, and you know, he, <clears throat> the, the, you know, my old man was really the titan in my eyes. That's what I have to say about that. And, and so, again, when I think about the pressure growing up in this family, it's a happy responsibility. Look, we've been, uh, you know, our family, had what, my grandfather married well. We've had every opportunity in the world we could have. And it's, I frankly, so glad to see so many veterans here because, uh, you know, on the one hand, um, I'm taking my father's advice because he, I used to think that he was disappointed that I didn't go in the military. And I almost went to the Naval Academy and I just blinked at the last minute and there wasn't an impending war. And I just thought, Jesus, we'd max the course in this area. So if I want to, you know, and I looked at how, what a tough time my father had carving out his own a legacy, and I decided to try something else. But I think what my father, who, again, passed away about 13 years ago, and it took me a book to figure this out, to write a book about him, is that I think what he really wanted us all to do was find our authentic path. He used to tell me, he said, and he, I, I showed a picture of the other day of him at, uh, um, uh, in Vietnam, is he calls it his obit photo because it's his favorite picture of himself, the one you saw there. Um, um, and and he said that if you can blend your vocation with your avocation, you know that's the secret to a happy life. And the only other thing he told me, which I said today to the students, was was fine. You know, if what we all we quoted from everything in my family. My grandfather quoted from everything. I quote from everything. Anything that works, that's what he used. He's a Christian, but I think he would quote from the. You know, he quoted from Sun Tzu. He quoted from. You know, Clausewitz, Napoleon, anybody that would help him move the ball forward. And my dad used to quote from Ecclesiastes saying, whatsoever your hand findeth itself to do, do it with thy might. And I'll just finish with a couple of quick things on, on what I'm doing, and we won't, we won't show you anything from it, but basically, and I don't do this to, to, because I feel responsible to the legacy in this way, all we were required to do as patents is honor our legacy with integrity and leave the world better than we found it. And it just so happens that I love filmmaking and I happen to like, enjoy the, the uh, psychology and developmental psychology and working with kids and families. And so I started an organization called the Patent Veterans Project and we hold therapeutic filmmaking workshops all over the country and uh, at military bases and VA hospitals and clinics. And we were doing it for five years and not getting a lot of notice. But basically there are veterans that come back from theater and they just don't want to talk about stuff. They don't want to talk about their family, particularly their family. They don't want to talk about it even with people like me. And, and, but maybe they're willing to make a movie about some aspect of it without revealing a single fact of themselves that they don't want to, but maybe they can make a film that, that channels some aspect of what they've experienced that doesn't require them to relive it. And so that's what we've found. We've put, we put a dozen veterans in a room with four or five filmmakers over the course of several days. They don't know each other. They don't know us. Some of my instructors are veterans, and, and they will just craft a film. And it's not sitting in front of a camera unloading your story. It could be with G.I. Joe's or Buzz, Buzz Lightyear or photographs or anything you want. And they, and they can choose it, it, to, to the extent and exactly how they engage with their history. And because you're doing it two or three other people, it really can't be about your story only. So it allows you to broaden out and make something that you would say is more archetypal, more representative of something you've experienced. Sexual trauma, getting shot at, losing a leg, losing a friend, transitioning home, not having a job, all that kind of things. And we've made about 400 films at this point, worked with about 1,000 veterans, and about a year ago, the VA, despite its dynamic leadership situation, um, uh, gave us some support, and we're doing a study now around the idea that is there something about this kind of a process which can help unlock some things in a veteran and make them care about themselves and care about their family in different ways. And, and I think if, you, if you're interested in finding out more about it, I think we put some wristbands out the, out the back door there and you can take a look at some of the films. And I think you'll hear more about this in the next year or so because all of a sudden people are paying attention and realizing that half of veterans that have PTSD or depression don't seek care. And a lot of those commit suicide. And the accurate number that I've heard now is about 20 a day 
and that's still a very, very high number. So I just want to say it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, I would like to, somebody asked us this earlier, and, and, and uh, it's just to say that I would like people to leave here with a better sense of history, with a better sense of the importance of history, so we don't repeat it all the time. And, and also for this group here in particular, and, and the civilians here, to remind ourselves that events like this, wonderful events like this that bring 100 people together or more to talk about veterans, are, should not be the only time we think about our vets. They should simply be reminders, sort of, they should just sort of be reminders that, that we need to think about our veterans and their families every day. So thank you very much. And I guess, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And we've got time, we're gonna do a couple questions we've gotten from Wofford students, and then we're gonna have a reception that everyone here is invited to, so you can spend time uh, with, with Ben and uh, with um, Kevin. But we've got a, uh, time for, for a couple questions, and we've gotten a lot that have come from the, um, the Wofford students. Ben, I want to start with you. One question is, um, you know, your grandfather was also, you know, he wrote poetry. I mean, the guy was a Renaissance man. And uh, what, one thing I was struck with was that, you know, your grandfather's big uh, nemesis, his big rival in North Africa, and in North Africa was uh, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel but yet your father became friends with his son Manfred Rommel in Germany. It's a funny thing about chivalry, and I don't know if we have that anymore in, that, in the same way, but in those days it's like you, you, you do your battle and then you finish, and you go out and you know, break bread together. And, I, and, and so, yes, they were, their arch, they were arch nemeses in a certain sense. I think they always had a respect for each other. They never actually faced in battle, but their troops did. And then, interestingly, only died a year apart. You know, uh, Rommel was, was forced to commit suicide to save his family in the fall of 1944. My grandfather died a year later. But my dad had always wanted to meet Rommel. Uh, my grandfather had always wanted to meet Rommel. Then when he died, my uh, grandmother wanted to meet them. She didn't have an opportunity. Then my father wanted to meet at least the widow. So when he was stationed in the 50s, I guess around 1958 in, in Stuttgart, Germany, uh, that's where the Rommel family lived. Manfred Rommel, who was about 16 when his father was forced to commit suicide, and uh, he became a civil servant in Stuttgart. I don't know, has anyone ever heard of Manfred Rommel by any chance? Because he's a wonderful statesman. People say he could have been Chancellor of Germany anytime he wanted, but he always said that, he said that, that the chancellors were more about being in, in an opera house, and he said mayors had to get things done. He said they, he didn't, you know, the opera house, they wanted to, everybody wanted to hear to have their voice be heard. But, but anyway, so they, they went over, my dad called up, the house and said I'd like to come over and set up, you know, he had some, set up a visit to come over and meet Mrs. Frau Rommel, brought, and because he has a sense of history, he not only brought my mother, but he brought my then five-year-old oldest sister over to meet him. Ever since then, we were stationed two times in Stuttgart in my lifetime, and we would go and visit the Rommels always on Christmas Eve because not only did they become friends, but they both shared a birthday of Christmas Eve. So imagine, you, I'm like there, I'm 10 years old, and they're trading maps and memorabilia, and they became great friends. He was the mayor of Stuttgart for 22 years during my two, visit, two tours we had there. And the last time we lived there, the very last thing they did together, 1979 when we moved away, was they went and they planted a grove of trees, a pair of Christmas trees, on, on uh, Robinson Barracks on an army base in Stuttgart, and they called it Friendship Grove. And there's been about 20 trees planted there since, and I just think the whole thing is awesome. It's fascinating. And I gotta tell you too, I've seen firsthand the difference is the Patent Veterans Project is making with our veterans. I got a chance to meet with some of them and appreciate what you do. Kevin, let me ask you, your, um, your great-great-grandfather was a visionary. He saw World War II coming before America was ready. He did his best to prepare the country, but it was also a time when America was hurting too. My own grandfather was in a civilian conservation corps, CCC camp. How many of y'all heard about the CCC camps? I've heard those stories from my grandfather. It was a tough time, but he was a visionary. He was. I mean, he's definitely ahead of his time, but he realized the importance of planning and, and building a structure. Um, at the time, we needed to build up our military. Um, I think we realized that. Um, and, and that's something that he started to do. But as far as um, really the Great Depression, I think a lot of people were struggling. And so uh, he was the face of it. Um, <coughs> luckily, he wasn't president, um, you know, during the uh, late 20s. So he got to avoid a lot of that. But um, you know, through all of his programs with the New Deal, uh, he was able to give a sense of hope to people. Um, 
And it takes time uh, when, when there's economic difficulties, when people are struggling. Um, it's not going to change overnight. You're not going to get a check in the mail and, and things are going to be better. Um, it, you have to change the culture. You have to um, find where corruption is and, and stamp it out. But as far as the uh, being a visionary, he was way ahead of his time. Um, as far as planning the United Nations, um, realizing that uh, something needed to be done, there, there needed to be a change in the way that we handle diplomatic situations too. Question to both of you. What if, I mean, Roosevelt and Patton were both so critical to the war effort for this country and for achieving victory when, like I said, at the beginning, freedom was hanging by threads. What if Patton and Roosevelt had lived? How would a post World War II Europe have looked? What do you think, Ben? Well, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot today, actually. I mean, the first thing that, not to, I want to answer the question, but it struck me that both of them, I think they were both visionaries, certainly, certainly Roosevelt and my grandfather, my grandfather wrote a paper about how he thought the Japanese were going to, if he were Japanese, he would attack Pearl Harbor. That was written in 1934. And, you know, and, he, was, and he was commanding tanks in 1918, you know, 17. So, 1918. But, um, but as far as that goes, people often ask, oh, we should have killed, the, gotten the Russians and all that stuff. I don't think anybody really felt we were going to go attack the Russians. They were still pretty formidable, first of all. And they were angry, too. But, but I am struck by the fact that, um, one, that they didn't, either, either one of them had a chance to, like Lincoln, to, 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 to bask in the spoils of success of what they did. My grandfather died right after the war. In fact, he was fired for, you know, silly thing after the war, and he ended up losing his command. You know, it was after, he, he, you know, he won his battles, but then he was sort of didn't, didn't work well in a civilian context. And likewise, and then six months, you know, a couple months later, he died. And likewise, Franklin Roosevelt died in April 1945, and so they didn't really get to appreciate it. In terms of how the world will look different, well, I think the big thing that I was thinking about today is that the famous Potsdam Conference, you know, the end of the, the last of the Yalta Conferences, was where they really, and I'm sure many of you know this history better than I do, especially you, Dr. Burns, but that they, they were deciding the breakup of Europe. And, and I'm kind of a Truman fan, actually, but, but the fact is, in, in July of, of, of uh, 1945, you had Truman, who really did not have a particularly close relationship with FDR, and then FDR died in April. I think they only met like twice. He knew nothing about the Manhattan Project and, and all that. And so you have him, and then you have... Um, Churchill, I don't know if you all remember this, but he was voted out of office in the middle of the conference. He had to leave, because in Britain, when you get voted out, you have to leave that, you're done that day. So he, in the middle, and Clement Attlee comes in there, who wasn't a big fan of his and had a totally different worldview, and then you had Stalin. So who wins that battle? And I gotta believe if, 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 um, if Roosevelt had been around a bit longer, and Churchill, I think he might have even been able to go over there and speak in the House of Commons or something and campaign for, <laughs> campaign for Churchill. But I just got to believe things would have been a little bit different. And um, don't get in, I won't get into the fact that taking all my grandfather's gasoline in the fall of 1944 and how that would have changed things. But that's a whole different story. But, uh, um, yeah. I'll keep my answer short. I, I would like to, I like to think that certain social policies would, would have never uh, really went through, like the Great Leap Forward in China. Um, you know, certain programs in Russia where really millions of people died, um, either of starvation or political camps. Um, so I, I would like to think that he would have some control um, over that, and they wouldn't take such reckless uh, decisions um, involving, you know, millions of people. Wow. This has been fascinating, and like I said, we do, I mean, I want to thank Wofford for doing this, too, because, uh, like I said, education is a national security issue. We've got VE Day next week, and, and uh, it is about that greatest generation who, when uh, freedom was hanging by a thread, they were there. And it's important to remember that and to learn from that. And uh, we've got a reception. Everybody's invited. We have food, drink, come and spend some time and talk to Kevin and talk to Ben. And, and let's give a hand to Van Hip here, because he was already standing when he asked all of you all to stand, but he's a veteran. <laughs> So, we're going to go over to the Papadopoulos building for the reception. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.